morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody in the Lord's house this morning. It's a good start, even if me and Maui doesn't know what's going on. And uh, but we're glad that each of you are here in the Lord's house this morning. Let's let Teresa play through that again. Everybody find someone to shake hands with and welcome everybody to church this morning. Real quick. <laughs> Praying 
just spending time there in intercession to the Lord. Uh, as we uh, then, as we get close to next uh, next Lord's Day, Saturday, ladies, your Bible study has kicked into gear. Uh, if you still haven't picked up your books or you need something, see Teresa. Uh, those of you that say, well, you know, I didn't know if I should or I shouldn't, it's not too late. Hop right on in. Go see Teresa and talk with her. We'll see what we can do to help you get the set of books and get you involved. Ladies, you ought to come to that. Y'all, you ladies that came, did y'all have a good time last, uh, last yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. So... So we had our Valentine banquet. Thank you for all the ladies that made that possible. Very nice dinner and uh, a lot of fun and fellowship. Learned a few things. Learned a few things. I, you know, I asked the question, what's the dumbest thing you ever did for the name of love? Has some interesting responses. Real interesting responses. And so... And then learned some things afterwards. I, I was told that Gail was late to her own wedding. Bill was telling me, he, he was almost still crying over it because it was traumatic. Because he said, I thought I was stood up. And then she started telling me about why she was late to her wedding. But we'll leave that story off. We're done now, okay? Gail said, please don't tell that church. You'll find out from Gail what happened, all right? And so, that's all right, Gail, make them sweat, right? That's right. She was making me sweat, too. Yeah, we won't talk about that either. Uh, all right, uh, next Sunday we will have our, our normal worship service like we normally do, and then that's the last normal Sunday we have for a while. Uh, the entire month of March is going to be a very busy Sunday. The first four Sundays of March, we're going to have our missions month. If you're new to our church, uh, this, is, this is our time to get refocused on why we exist. Why does Bible Baptist Church exist? And, and what is our mission? God has given us a very clear mandate that we are to go out and to win people to Christ and to help to get that done, not just here, but around the world. And we want to get that done. And, uh, and so we're having missionaries come in and preach to us. A uh, great, great time of, of our calendar year. I love March. It's a great time for us to be drawn into the presence of God, take a long look at our hearts and our lives and what God is doing in our lives. Our missionaries, who, uh, our missionaries are coming in. They'll be here on Sunday mornings. We start off at Sunday school. Uh, they'll be giving their testimonies at Sunday school, introducing us to themselves. And then we're going to break apart and let them go spend time with our younger people. And, uh, and then in the morning service, uh, they'll be preaching. They'll be showing their presentations of what they're trying to get accomplished. And then uh, uh, some of them will be staying over for that evening and preaching in the evening service as well. Uh, some of them are heading out to Freedom to spend some time out there in Freedom. We're partnering up with Dale out there uh, so they can spend some time out there in Freedom as well. And then uh, after our Sunday morning service, starting in, in uh, a week from next Sunday, we're going to have lunch every Sunday for the next four Sundays here at the church. Bring enough food for your family and plus a couple others. It'll be great. We'll have a good time of fellowship. And, and the goal is to spend time with these missionaries. And, uh, and to have a, a time together as a church family. The last Sunday of March, is March has got five Sundays, the last Sunday is Easter Sunday. And I absolutely love Easter Sunday here at our church. We'll be having a sunrise service. We're going to have uh, uh, pastor class heavenly biscuits and gravy. Yeah, there's, a, there's a few people that like it. <laughs> And then, uh, and then we'll have our, our morning worship service and our evening worship service as we normally do. But Easter is such a wonderful time to be reminded of what Christ did for us. I love when Easter and Missions Month meet together because we, we get burned to tell the story and reminded what the story is. That He came for us to win our souls and to win us back to Him. And so it is good to be in God's house this morning. That's all the announcements I have. Oh, by the way, I found a, a contact eye case out in the parking lot. Now, it doesn't have any contacts in it. It's sort of a teal color. If you're missing a contact case, I've got it. Okay? I don't get to see if it has any contact in it. It doesn't. So if you lost your case, come see me after church. I'll make sure you get it. But we found that the other day, and I'm going to make sure that it gets back to its right form. All right, that's it on my way to announcements. Come on up here, brother, and we'll use some more songs.
that type of prayer, Lord, that we are seekers of your heart. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 3, the King Solomon tells his son, he says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not into thy own understanding. And all thy ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy paths. You know, I am so grateful that we have a God that we can trust. Amen? Amen. Now I want you to think about that. We put our trust in so many things that sometimes are untrustworthy. But here the Lord says, trust me. Trust the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own self, but lean on Him. That's good advice, isn't it? Let us think about these things as we worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. You may be seated. Thank you. 
got the word, and so we'll dismiss our kids. Let them get to the back. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11 as we continue our journey through the book of Philippians. It is quite evident that we are going to get interrupted. Uh, it's my hope and prayer that the Lord allows us to finish up chapter 3 so that after Easter we can come back and, and catch chapter 4 and let it finish up. We don't want to leave it dangling because we want to finish it up, if you will. But we do know that there is an interruption coming. I apologize about the television to my right. Uh, we have a short cable, and uh, I thought that we could hold off for another month or so, but uh, evidently today it's about to drive me crazy. Every time I look up, it's flashing again. Uh, so I apologize about that, and we got a cable in order to get it replaced, and uh, uh, so it, it won't short out like that again. But don't let that distract you. We're here to worship the Lord, and, and uh, so Philippians chapter 3, verse number 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To, to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the, the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might have also, also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day in the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews is touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching righteousness, which is uh, in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, I count loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I will count all uh, uh, things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffer the loss of all things. And do count them but dumb that I may win Christ. And be found in Him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is uh, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable to his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Father, bless, Lord, the Word of God. The burden that you laid upon my heart through this text, I'm going to transmit it to you, be honoring and glorifying to you. And Lord, I pray that the Word of God would have its free course right now and speak to each of our hearts and our lives. The Holy Spirit would apply the truths of God's Word to us. And Lord, that it would forever change us and do its mighty work. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Here in chapter 3, and pretty much throughout the entire chapter, the Apostle Paul now takes this idea of rejoicing and he's going to take it a step further. He is now going to look at the relationship that we have with God and he's going to talk about some warnings He's going to talk about uh, uh, some things that you and I have to make some decisions about. In verse 3, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And we know that that's been the theme throughout this book, that God wants us to have a place in our lives where we just have some real joy. Not the happiness that comes from telling a silly joke, but the joy that is there no matter what's happening to me. Whether I, I'm having a, a really good day or a really lousy day, that I have joy in Christ. But to have joy in Christ, and we looked at a lot of different things, it boils down to, if you will, the sort of the the the, the, the all of the book of Philippians comes up to chapter three. And it comes up to this understanding that if I want to have joy in God, I've got to have a proper relationship with God. And this morning, this message. From the Word of God, I, 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 I think will really drive home some things about understanding what it means to have a relationship with God. Because there's a lot of folks that are maybe even in here with us this morning that may not have the right relationship with God. 
that they may have something that's anything but a real relationship. So let's look at some things, if you will, this morning. The first thing I want you to see is the, the warning that is given. He says, for me to write the same things to you is, is to me indeed not grievous, but for you it is safe. In verse 2 he says, beware of dogs. Now he's not telling us that we need to watch out for dogs. I mean, well, there's some of y'all got some dogs we need to watch out for. <laughs> not, not yours. Yeah, I know. Your dogs are nice. Yeah, we know that. Uh, he says, beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Let me give you three things about this morning. First of all, there's a need for warning because there's a danger. There's a real danger that is out there. He says, uh, it's not grievous for me to write and talk about these things because it's safe for you. And in all reality, in our lives are surrounded with all kinds of landmines, aren't they? Can you imagine being out in the field not knowing where the landmines are? And one misstep would be the end. But in reality, that's where life is, isn't it? How many decisions do you, do you face with on a daily basis? <laughs> That sometimes we don't even realize the ramifications of them and how that they are life-changing decisions. And you and I have all seen people, we've seen in our own lives, where just one bad choice leads to a series of consequences that are quite devastating to a person's life. And there's landmines all around us, and, and there is a danger that is there. You and I need to be aware of that danger. That danger, uh, there's two foes to that danger. The danger that we can lose the joy of our life now. And we can ruin what God has given us in life. But even the greater danger that we can miss heaven. Brothers and sisters, I still believe the Bible is still true. And I, I, I disagree with these people that continue to try to think things out of the Scriptures. They don't feel like it fits our modern age. I, I, I tell you, I'm not concerned whether or not it fits the modern age. I just want to know what God's Word says. And God's Word reminds me that there's a hell to avoid and a heaven to gain. And it's very stern about that warning. <coughs> the hell is very real. And no one sends us to hell but we ourselves. Don't start trying to tell me how a loving God can't send someone to hell because you and I choose to. Because a loving God sent us a way to go to heaven. Through Christ. And there is a danger. And Paul says, I want you to be safe. And there's no greater burden in my heart than to know that one day when we're all in, that we're all in heaven together. It's all that matters, isn't it? That we're all there. We're all safe. He says, I need to warn you because there's false teachers in verse number 2. He said, beware of the dogs. He calls them dogs. He says, beware of the evil men. Beware of the concision. And he talks about circumcision here. He was referring to this, this group of people that were constantly chasing Paul around. And Paul would come in. He would start the church. And here comes these people come in. And they said, well, now, now listen. If you want to be a proper Christian, and then you need to start doing this, this, and this, and this. And, this. and it was basically trying to follow the Old Testament law. Uh, they were trying to make them Jews. And Paul was preaching to Gentiles. The, uh, the Philippian church was a Gentile church. It wasn't a Jewish church. It was a church full of people that were a part of the Greek and Roman empires. And, 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 and Paul says, beware of these people. Because they'll slip in. And I'll say, well now, if you're going to be right, you need to be doing it this way. And you need to be doing it this way. And, and, and the most divisive thing was that of circumcision. And they come in, well, if you're going to be right with God, you better be circumcised. And, 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 and it was causing all kinds of problems because, because people were uncertain of their faith in Christ. That is faith alone in Christ enough? Or do I need to start adding some stuff to it, some rules and regulations? And, and then I developed spirituality by an outward conformity. <coughs> and, then if, and they were teaching, if you follow these rules, you're right with God. But can I tell you something? You can follow all the rules of the world because I can make you follow the rules, but it doesn't make you right with God. Huh? Parents, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You look at your kid and you say, clean the room. They look at you and they say, uh-uh. And you look at them and say, I'm bigger than you and I brought you the rule and I can take you out of the rule, clean your room. And they go in there and they're belly aching the whole hour they're doing it, right? 
And they look at you and they say, there, I'm done. I clean my room. Don't you pat yourself on the back and say, I won the battle. Because their heart is nowhere near where it needs to be. Right? Huh? You can make your child be obedient and their heart is so rebellious and full of hatred. And I, I'm telling you, we got that within our churches today. Let's, let's follow these rules. You do this, you're spiritual. And that confuses a lot of people. And I want to tell you something. There are a lot of false teachers out there. It amazes me today. Boy, they're slick. They look good, man. They learned how to have a proper PR campaign, if you will. Man, they, they, they're all polished and shiny. And boy, we, man. And we don't realize the evil and the false teaching that lurks right underneath the surface. And I want to tell you something. Be careful. Jesus said there's a lot of false teachers out there. He said that when he was here on earth. You think that's multiplied a little bit since he's left? There's some false teachers out there. There's need for warning because there's only one right way to worship. He said in verse 3, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now I want you to listen to me. Yeah, I, I like diversity. I like, I like being kind to all people and treating people with respect and honor. That's what we're supposed to do, amen? And what I'm about to say does not make me intolerant. It's just the way things are. There's only one way to serve God. Did you hear me? And it's good at His way. Not my way, His way. In John chapter 4, when the woman of the well and Jesus was having a conversation about her soul, she says, well, now, now I perceive that you're a prophet. Now, you say you're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. And we say we're supposed to worship in Samaria. Now, who's right? And Jesus said the most profound words. He said that God is seeking people to worship Him in the Spirit and in truth. Do understand that God is looking for people not just to worship Him, but to worship Him rightly. So how do I worship God rightly? How do I know I'm doing it right? What is our authority? Oh, come on now. Don't y'all don't break my heart this morning. What is our authority around here? The Word of God. Amen? Right? Thus saith the Word of God. Our Bibles in your laps, and your computer, in your lap, whatever you got that you brought today that's got scriptures on it, that Bible is our authority. We don't do things because that's the way we've always do it. We don't do things because we feel that's the best way. We do things because we're trying to be pleasing to God. Amen? And doing it the way He says we ought to do it. And if God says this is how I want it done, and we do it something else, guess what? We're not doing it right. Amen? There is a right way and there is a wrong way. And that's the danger that is involved. That's the warning. In verse 4 through 7, he talks about the danger. He says, Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I mourn. Now, when he refers to the flesh, he's referring to that old, that old man, who he was before Christ. And this is what Paul says. He said, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of the Hebrews is touching the law of Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching righteousness, which is uh, in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. Paul said, let me tell you how I was. He said, I was, I was raised right. I was circumcised the eighth day. I, I was raised as a Hebrew. I was of the stock of Israel. I was God's chosen people. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I mean, he had a, a heritage there. And now, now, don't get me wrong. I am grateful for a godly heritage. Amen? I look at my wife and I envy her all the time because she grew up in such a God-fearing home. And a God-honored family. And I thank God for parents that are raising their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord like we're supposed to be. And it sets that godly heritage. And if you've got a godly heritage, you ought to thank God every day for that. 
And Paul said, that's the way I was raised. He said, he says, listen to me. He said, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He says, touching the, the law, I was a Pharisee. Now we know about the Pharisees because we saw the interaction with Jesus. And we get on to the Pharisees all the time. But I want to tell you something. The Pharisees took their faith serious. Man, they, they, man, they, they, they upheld the law to the most finest points and details. And we look at the Pharisees, we mock them a little bit for their interactions with Jesus. But I want to tell you something. These were men that were dedicated. And he was dedicated. He doesn't talk about it here in the scripture, but, but Paul was trained by some of the greatest leaders in Hebrew uh, minds of his day and age. Concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. Man, he was the one that gave consent to Stephen's death, the first martyr. And he didn't stop there. The day that he met Christ, he was carrying letters to Damascus. <clears throat> he was on his way to, to persecute Christians in Damascus, and people were literally terrified of him. And when Paul got saved and trusted Christ the Savior, the church was still scared of him because of his zeal. He was passionate. As such the law blameless, he lived it. And I want to tell you something. If we were to bring Paul in here, the Paul before Christ, every one of us said, Man, what a what a spiritual young man. What an example of faith. But his heart is far from God. Because you see, there's an underlying danger in religion. Did you hear me this morning? I want you to think about it, if you will. There was a danger of self-confidence in verse 4. Uh, that I might also have confidence in the flesh. He looked around and he looked at his life and he said, Man, I feel confident. And I want to tell you something. Self-confidence is very deceiving. Huh? How many times have you ever said to yourself, man, I'll be okay? Now, some of y'all in here play that little game with your gas gauge. You know, it's, it's getting close to you and you say, oh, I'll be okay. That's okay. Until about two blocks away from the gas station, you hear this sputter, sputter. Right? <coughs> have you ever had that? Man, I'm okay. I got it. Only well, find out you don't have it. Amen? Right? Self confidence gets you in trouble every time. There's the danger of pride. Can you see it here? I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was a Pharisee. <coughs> and boy, you better be careful of pride. Pride is the original sin. But well, look at me. I went to church today. And I'm so good. Be careful. You see, that's the problem with religion. That's the reason why a lot of people got religion. Because it stokes their pride. Huh? It makes them feel good about themselves. Listen to me. We don't want to come to church and feel miserable about ourselves. We want to come to church and feel good. Be careful with that. Sometimes there's a, there's a place for brokenness. Sometimes there's a place for guilt and shame to come in. To show us our need for Christ. Amen? Right? There's the danger of self-righteousness concerning the zeal persecuting the church. Touching righteousness, which is the law of blameless. Was Paul blameless? No, he wasn't. But he said, that was my attitude. Man, I'm okay. And we do that all the time, don't we? I don't have any problems. I'm, I'm glad church got somebody recovered for those people. I don't need anything. I'm good. Amen. Right? Because you know what we do in religion? We look at our neighbor. But we don't look at our neighbor that's doing it better than us. We find the neighbor that is not doing so good. Yeah, I'm better than him. But can I tell you something? Every time you look down and say, I'm better than you, there's someone looking up above you. They're looking down on you saying, I'm better than you. Because we can't compare ourselves with each other because we're all sinners. And self-righteousness, we, we begin to develop our own uh, morality and our own feelings about things. And we don't consider what God has to say about the matter. And we don't consider what God's opinion about your life is. Listen to me. I don't care what your opinion of your life is. What does God have to say about your life right now? That's to whom we ought to be concerned about. You see, self-righteousness can be very deceiving and deceptive. And then we have the danger of possession. He said, but what things were gained to me, 
those I counted lost for Christ. And I want you to just understand something here. I want you to take the first part, because the second part we'll look at here in a moment. He said, those were gained to me. In other words, I've got something. Now I want to tell you something. I want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to me very carefully. I'm glad you're here this morning. But if you're here because you're looking for religion, you're here for the wrong reason. That's what religion does. It gives us self-confidence. We put trust in the things that we do. Well, Brother Clapp, I went to church this week. I put five dollars in the offering plate. Woohoo! Big spender here. Five dollars. I got baptized. I helped with a project last night at the Valentine banquet. I laughed at your silly stuff, and I put the chairs up afterwards. I am something. And there's the danger. Because as you start to do and do and do, you begin to think you have something. And Jesus said there will be a group of people in eternity that will look at Him as He casts them into hell and say, did we prophesy in Your name? Did we do good works? Weren't we there serving You? And Jesus will say to them, I never knew You. Because you can come to church all the days of your life. You can get involved in church all the days of your life. You can do spiritual things all the days of your life. But until you know who He is and have a relationship with Him, all you've got is a dead religion and dead religion will get you one inch to heaven. Because heaven is not about what you've done and where you've been. Heaven is about who you know. That's the danger, my friends. And there has to come to a place where we abandon religion. You see, Paul had to come to a place where he abandoned his religion. In verse number 7, he said, What things were gained for me, I count loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my, or Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I might win. Christ. He's talking about a person here, isn't he? He's not talking about religion. He's talking about a person. He said, I count all these things as, as dumb. He said, these things are worthless to me that I might have Christ. But here's the word. And it's used twice. Those things I count count it loss. Verse 7. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things. It was an accounting word. And it does exactly what you do. How many of y'all get your taxes ready? Huh? Now, if you got your taxes done, don't admit it. Amen? Right? Mine's sitting in the file folder. I got my last piece of paper the other day, and I thought, you know what this means? It's time. But we all do some accounting in our lives. You sit down and you figure out how much money you have, figure out how many bills you have, and what you need to pay, and how you need to pay, and making sure you got your bases covered, right? That's accounting. It's taking a look at the picture and seeing what needs to be done and getting it done. In other words, if you want to abandon religion, you know what you got to do? This morning, you got to take a look at your heart. And we don't like going there. Because we know what's inside of us. Amen? We like looking at the polished outside exterior. But we can't. We're going to have to take a long look at our lives. Can I tell you what happened for the Apostle Paul? On the way to Damascus, Jesus Christ interrupted him, knocked him down to his knees, and he said, uh, Who are you? And he, or the question was asked, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why do you persecute me? Why do you kick against the pricks? You know what a prick was? A prick was a sharp stick that was stuck on the back of a, of, a, of a wooden plow. So when the animal would kick at it, it would stick them and they would learn not to kick back. Because you kick back at a wooden plow, you might break it all to pieces, right? And another prick was ideal of this. They had a long stick with a sharp end on it. And they would hit the animals as they would go. And go, I get their attention, man. I tell you what, you put a little probe to a cow or an ox and it gets their attention pretty quick, doesn't it? And God says, Paul, I've been pricking at your conscience and you're not listening to me. And that moment, he called Jesus Christ Lord when he realized who he was. And you know what happened? 
He got up from there blind, and he was blind for three days, waiting for Ananias to come and to baptize him. And when Ananias baptized him, the scales fell off his eyes, and it was literally graphic of what was happening. He was realizing what he had was nothing but a false way of life. And then he didn't have Christ. But now he has Christ. I've counted this stuff. <clears throat> and this stuff is all lost. I need Christ. And my question to you this morning is, do you have Christ or do you have a religion? Huh? Are you going to go away and say, man, I feel good because I was in church. Man, man, God must be happy because I was in church today. Or do you go away and say, man, it was good to meet with the living God of the universe. Do you have a relationship with God? When you're account, you're doing accounting, what, what's the, the end thing? You're looking at the bottom line, aren't you? Huh? Am I in the red or am I in the black? And let, let's look at your life. Let's look at it all now for a moment. Let's think about it for a moment. Are you in the red or are you in the black? Huh? Have you been moving ahead? Are you in a spiritual standstill? Huh? Do you know it? Or are you in, Huh? Are you changing? Are you just trying to stop stuff? Did you hear me? Do you see God working in your life and you have this ongoing relationship with Him? Are you just set here empty and hollow wondering what everybody's smiling about? Can I tell you, you can be a vital part of this church and set these pews and be involved in all kinds of stuff and be as far away from God as never before. Did you hear me? And that's what scares me. Because you can sit in here and have a form of religion and think you're safe. But there's no inward change and you don't know it and you don't have a relationship with it. You're self-deceiving yourself. Do you know how many people today call themselves Christians and they don't know Christ? Huh? I mean, people today say, well, yeah. You know, it's funny that I, I meet more Baptists on the face of the earth than I've ever met in my life. And you go to church? Well, I'm a Baptist. Do you go to church? No, I'm a Baptist. What does that mean? I don't know, I'm just a Baptist, okay? <laughs> right? Huh? They don't have a clue what they're saying. Are you a Christian? Yes. Why are you a Christian? Well, I, I don't know, it sounds like a good place to call myself. I'm a Christian, okay? Do you know Christ? Well, I know of him. You know, he came at Christmas time, he left at Easter time. Yeah, I, I got it. No, do you know him? Because you see, one difference between Christ and all the other gods in this world, our God's a living God. Huh? He's live, He's real, He's a person. And you can meet with Him. Did you hear me? You can meet with Him today. Look at verse number 9. And be abound in Him. Not having my own righteousness which is of the law. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which God, which is of God by faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death. Verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Let me tell you about the joy of, 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 of this relationship. There's the joy of his righteousness. He said, being found in Him, not have my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Righteousness. He said, he said I had this righteousness that is of the law. In other words, I went and said, Thou shalt not kill. Okay, I won't kill. <clears throat> Thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, I won't commit adultery. Got it. So I haven't killed, I haven't committed adultery. I'm good. I'm righteous. Pretty good old boy. 
And then here comes Jesus of Nazareth, and he stands on that on that mountain and gave his sermon uh, on the mountain there in Matthew chapter five, six, and seven. And Jesus said, "You know, you've heard it said of old, thou shalt not kill." Hmm? Yeah, I haven't killed anybody, and I don't think any of y'all in here are murderers. I hope not. If you got a body buried somewhere, you might talk to me afterwards when you get that resolved, okay? <laughs> Amen? But Jesus said, but I say unto you that if you've ever hated your brother, if you've ever been angry at your brother, you've already committed murder. Whoa. Because there's not one of you here that I hope that none of you are here are murderers. But I know every one of you have been angry with somebody. Every one of you have had to deal with that the state of hatred within your heart. Jesus said, you've heard of it old. It was said, thou should not commit adultery. Never commit adultery. I'm good. But I say unto you, that if you look after a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery. And all you women are going, yeah, get them, brother, come get them, men. Ladies, it goes both ways. Oh, I haven't committed adultery. It, and I, I was told one time, it's okay to look. Really? Not what my Jesus said. You see, you say, well, why was Jesus changing things? He wasn't changing things. He was trying to explain to you what a relationship does. Because you see, the law, it says don't kill. We'll get as close to killing as we can. But hey, I haven't stepped over the line. I'm okay. Huh? And Jesus said, no, a relationship will break you away from that line, so far away from that line. I don't know about you folks, but I'm tired of having hatred and anger in my heart. And I struggle with that on a daily basis, just like you do. God, take that away from me. Amen? You see, Paul says, I don't want my righteousness. And that's what all of you got. We're all struggling with our righteousness. Paul says, I want to have His righteousness. His righteousness is so much better. Amen? Then he says, that I may know Him. That's relationship talk, isn't it? Amen? That I may know Him. I don't care if you're a Baptist. I don't care if you call yourself a Christian. I don't care if you went to church today. What I want to know is, do you know Him? That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings be made conformable unto His death. Paul says, I want to experience the power of His resurrection. And I want to tell you something. I'm so tired of people saying, well, you know, God did some pretty neat things in the old Bible days. I'm sorry, but he still does some pretty awesome things today. Amen? Oh, sure, he ain't going to go part the Red Sea like he'd done before. But I want to tell you what, I passed some Red Seas since God's parted. Amen? Oh, he hasn't taken out a visible giant for everybody to see, but I want to tell you something, this old boy's had some giants he's taken out of the way. Paul says, I want to know his power. And see, that's the difference between religion and relationship. Religion, there is no power in it. The effort is in your part, and your part isn't good enough, is it? You can try, you can try, and you can try, and you'll never be satisfied. But I want to tell you something. You experience the resurrection power that He has to offer, and you'll be satisfied. Because you'll see Him start to change your life. And how does God change? Let me be reminded, I, I'm trying to drive this home, and I say it all the time. How does God change a person? Inward? Outward. Religion says, let me change the outward. We're not worried about the inward part. Just make sure the outward is conformable. You wear your nice church clothes, and you're sitting in your nice church view, and you act in all your church ways. You're spiritual. Another can be further from the truth. I would have a feeling, I, su I suspect, that Satan himself can slither in here with the right clothes, and the right attitude, and the right words, and he can sit here, and we'd all think he was the most spiritual man that ever walked in the church. Huh? Have you met His power? Let me ask you something. Is your life changing right now? Have you been experiencing change in your life? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
Something's changed, amen? But if a man is not in Christ, there is no change. And I'll never forget that about my life. Because the day I swallowed and took a big old bite of religion, I remember the next day sitting there listening to my, my, my best friend in high school tell me a dirty joke and I was laughing at it. And the Holy Spirit of God smoked my heart as a kid. He says, weren't you just getting religion? Weren't you just in church? And now you're laughing at that? And I remember thinking there was no change in a part that desperately needed to change. And it wasn't me until four years later when I met Him. And I set aside religion and I began a relationship that the change started to happen. Amen? And there's the joy of heaven if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. That one day I will be in the fellowship of the saints. Because religion can never give you the assurance of heaven. Huh? I sit in church for four years and every time I think that, man, I'm not going to heaven, I would think to myself, I'm just not doing enough. And I start doing more stuff. I mean, I got my driver's license. I went to my youth pastor and said, I'll drive a bus! I got to do something because I want to know for sure I'm going to heaven. I got to do this. And he looked at me and said, I ain't letting you drive no bus. Smartest decision you ever made in his life. <laughs> but you ought to hurt that church. Oh, that John, he, oh, he's such a dedicated worker. He came up here and scraped the ice all day long. Oh, he, he's just a godly young man, and they did not know my heart. I pulled up to church listening to Ozzy Osbourne, turned it off, went inside, sat there, rolled my eyes with the whole eye that the preacher preached, which he just shot up so I could go back to my car, got my car, cranked it back up, and drove out of the parking lot, and I was not a changed man. Can I have religion? But I'm telling you, four years later, when I met Christ, all that stuff got set aside. Because I realized it was all about Christ. The reason why I go to church is so I can learn about Christ. The reason why I serve in church is because I want to serve Christ. And the reason why I want to change my life is because He's lead me and helped me to change. And the change was just so amazing to me. Because it was so much more effective and so much more powerful than religion. And this morning, I'm so concerned as a pastor. that some of you in here, you've got a religion... I'm glad you're here, but if you're here for religion, you've got to change. Because it'll end up in a place called hell because you think you've got something. And you wake up, you'll be shocked. I've always said, I've always had this idea, there's going to be a lot of shocked people in eternity. There's going to be people in heaven that are shocked by who's not there, and there's going to be people in hell that are shocked because they're there. Huh? Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, Take a long look at your life. Do some accounting today. The bottom line, have I experienced the living, resurrected Jesus Christ and has He started changing my life? Or have I been playing a spiritual game? And he said, well now Brother Clap, I can't, I can't go forward. I can't, I can't say that I'm lost because everybody thinks I'm a good godly Christian. And that's what the devil was by here for four years. Don't you tell them that you're lost. Don't you tell them that you think that you're going to die and go to hell. What will they think? And finally, I just realized I don't care what they think. Heaven, I don't want to miss heaven. And I want to know God. Would to God that today, Bible Baptist Church would have a revival on a group of people that says, we're done with religion. I want a relationship. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. This morning with every head bowed and every eyes closed. Like the piano player, we're going to just do another video song. That's the only way I know how to do these invitations. But now, with every head bowed and every eyes closed, in the quietness of this moment before the song starts, how many of you say, Brother Clap, I've got a religion and it's got to change? And I want it to change today. No one's looking around. I don't come to you after the service. It's between you and the Lord. But I want to pray for you. And you say, Pastor, that's me. 
I've got a religion, but I don't have a relationship. Slip up your hand. Be honest with God this morning. It's the first step to get things right with God. Is admitting that I need to change. Somebody, I see that hand. Someone else said, Pastor, I've got religion. I don't have a relationship. There's another hand. Take a look at your life. Do some counting. Father, speak to hearts right now. And change lives. Lord, if there's someone here that does not know you, that do not have a relationship with you, that today that would change. Work in people's hearts and minds. And it's about eyes are closed. As, as, the, as the song begins to play, why don't you do business with God? If you need something in your heart and your life, why don't you come to this altar? There's the quietness of this this morning. If you need to come right now. I'm finding myself at a loss for words. And the funny thing is, it's okay. The last thing I need is to be heard, but to hear what you would say.